hit the market in midsummer. That will be our 2016 report. And that very much lays out the key trends, who's issuing, what are they issuing, and what are the future projections of this very exciting market that we have before us. And it also gives a great regional and thematic focus on areas such as China and India, two very key markets that are currently participating and adding momentum to the growth of the market. And then, of course, the Climate Bond Standard and Certification Scheme, supporting the market growth through standardization, making it very clear about what green definitions, what the investment opportunities are, and how we can label green bonds and provide assurance through certification. So let's go to the basics. Essentially, what is a bond? A bond is debt. It's essentially, I owe you money. It is a loan that is given that uh, investors invest in and allows for issuers like a company or a government uh, or a bank to be able to uh, finance specific projects and assets, and they pay that back uh, to the investor over time. So it's a number of different types of entities. As I said, it could be companies, governments, it can be local, local governments like cities. They're usually uh, centered around large and mature assets. This is operational assets. This is very much not project finance where it's innovative new technologies of testing and, and, and new, new builds as much as it is uh, operational assets. Um, government backed in the sense of uh, government providing a guarantee uh, which is uh, providing security to the loans, which means that the investor is guaranteed to be paid back even if the issuer defaults, um, provides a very nice incentive to encourage investment in bonds. Um, usually they're rated, so what I mean by that is the creditworthiness of an issuer. Uh, usually an investment grade, high investment grade issuer is uh, bonds that are rated around A and above, so double A AA and triple A. And then the more you move down into the yield is what we say, uh, triple B, B minus, et cetera, uh, is, is determinant of what the credit rating of that issuer is. And of course, it can be done, bonds can be done in their local currency uh, or it can be in foreign currency, for example. So in issuing on the domestic market uh, or issuing on the international market. Um, project bonds, so may be secured against an asset itself. So the collateral is the actual projects and assets on the ground. And of course, it's important to note that bonds are a very important part of the portfolio for investors, such institutional investors, such as pension funds and insurance companies. It is also important to highlight that bonds are primarily about refinancing. So what do I mean by that? It means that it's a matter of um, Project, existing projects and assets and issuing debt on the back of those assets that are currently existing. And this is uh, allowing to free up capital, uh, for example, bank loan, uh, bank books that then uh, are freeing up capital for project finance, for example. And institutional investors will uh, pick up the debt over the long term as part of their long-term investment strategy. So um, this is a, an important note to make. Um, there's a long history of bond financing for the transition. Um, we've used bonds, uh, in fact, uh, historically to be able to rebuild cities. This is very much the case uh, uh, after World War II when uh, le uh, cities were uh, leveled to the ground um, and bonds were used to rebuild those, those cities. And so we have a number of examples. It's essentially a blueprint that's very much in place. And if we look at the example of the U.S. municipality market where they are issuing bonds uh, on the, uh, in the U.S. market on a regular basis. And so um, this is definitely not an innovation uh, to be had. So the challenge before us, and this is very much laying the scenes before we get into uh, why green bonds have even come into play in the first place, you know, we have ourselves uh, a climate challenge, uh, a climate challenge that has put forward an urgency to act. We have huge investment uh, opportunities before us. The scale is around 50 to 90 trillion. What we need is a trillion per annum now until 2050 to be able to address 
the infrastructure needs we have now and into the future to address climate change. That is affecting every major sector of the global economy and nowhere in the world is untouched. It is very clear that public sector capital alone will not be enough to address the problem. China, being the biggest public sector market in the world, has made it very clear that not even themselves are going to be able to deal with the problem alone. They are going to need to be able to access outside capital, private sector capital, to do this. And so, not only that, we have a, a, a time that is needed to do this as well. We do not have the luxury of sitting around and getting this done over the next 20, 30 years. We have a five to 10 year window where we really need to be rapidly transitioning implementing investment to the right projects and assets to be able to make the transition uh, to meet the challenge. It's about big emerging markets, uh, infrastructure and cities, um, urban planning across the board, public mass transit systems, water systems, energy systems integrated at the city level to be able to deal with the impact that we have before us. And the opportunities really do lie in the big, large markets, Southeast Asia, Latin America, India, and China. Much of this market so far has been laid down by the U.S. and the European markets, setting the stage for what is ahead. And now we're beginning to see the entry of folks like China and India coming to play. COP21 in Paris very much uh, built momentum around what we have before us. The climate action plans referred to as the INDCs that were put forward in Paris in December uh, built momentum for climate finance globally. And now we find ourselves in a post-Paris world where there's a lot of opportunity but there are challenges before us in getting deal flow, so being able to connect the North and the South, the emerging market opportunities and investment opportunities to Northern investors who are interested in investing in those emerging markets. And being able to transition the emerging markets into green economies over the long run. And of course, this notion that infrastructure uh, is traditional versus green. We need to be thinking that all infrastructure from now and into the future must be having a green element to it if we are to meet the challenges we have before us. And so, as I said, the investment required is, you know, in the trillions, as we know. Um, EIA looks at this as an investment. We should not be seeing this as cost. And of course, the world, there's enough capital to go around. And this is a very important point. As many times as I hear is there's, it's too much, it's too much capital, there's not enough. Well, look, we've got about 100 trillion of assets under management in the debt capital markets. The challenge is tapping that capital to the, and shuttling it down to the right projects and assets on the ground. We need discoverability. Thematic labeling of bonds is one way of doing that. It's a matchmaking exercise between investors who are looking for green product and bonds that are labeled or so that are giving them what they, they, they are looking for. It is the role of development banks. It's the role of governments acting as risk bridgers. What I mean by that is coming back to them being backing these bonds, providing guarantees that then make deal flow actually possible. So we need more, more green product into the market. It's about mitigation, but it is also about adaptation and resilience. We have, as I said, every major sector of the global economy that has key investment opportunities behind it to bring those economies, those sectors into a low carbon and climate resilient economy for 2050. Across energy, renewable energy, hydro, within the marine sector as well. We've got energy efficiency across our built environment and across our industries, industrial energy efficiency, for example. In transport, it's public mass transit at the city level. It's bus rapid transit systems, it's electric vehicles, it's more rail. It's, it's rail, long distance rail, it's, it's high speed rail. And of course in water, we're looking very much at adaptation. Um, being able to provide infrastructure that builds water security across our systems. And then within land use, waste and pollution and management, there are a number of areas that we can be considering and that we need to be looking at. This is most definitely not an exhaustive list. 
And so the emergence of green bonds represents one of the most significant developments in the financing of low carbon, climate resilient investment opportunities, a statement made very clear by Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General in lead up to COP uh, in Paris this past year. And this was found, uh, put forward in a report that they did and made it very clear that green bonds plays an incredibly important role in shifting capital at scale to be able to address our climate challenges. And so you must be asking yourselves at this stage, okay, what's in actually a green bond? So I went through the very basics of what a bond is, and essentially a green bond follows the same uh, characteristics to a degree. In fact, uh, green bonds have the same risk and reward return profile as every other type of bond. Um, the difference between them, though, is that the projects and assets tied to that bond are fitting a, an environmental objective. So there's a strong climate benefit, environmental benefit to the projects and assets behind that bond. There are, it is not a situation where investors are paying a premium for going green. Uh, this is a very important piece. Um, investors are getting exactly the same thing as if they invest in a regular bond. They're just going with a, they're, they're gaining a, a green feature to that bond. Think of it as a, as a bonus feature to the bond. And as I mentioned, much of uh, what we are seeing is, is refinancing of existing projects and assets, so existing wind farm, of existing solar, um, repackaging, and uh, then 90% investment grade as well. This is an important point, so um, at these early days of the development of the market, we are, uh, which is, is quite normal, is investors are looking for a high-grade product uh, into the market. A very important element to green bonds that is different is that there is a strong transparency and disclosure around the green projects and assets. And so uh, the need to have an independent review, which means an outside entity like a, um, uh, an auditing firm like PwC or KPMG or sustainability rating agency or the like that has the credentials, to provide a review to the bond writes up what the bond is offering so that investors can make a decision on whether they're going to buy the bond and the issuer making a commitment to reporting on the use of proceeds. So these are very important elements to the green bond story that has become quite attractive to investors. And of course, there's a number of different types of entities they can issue. So as I said, corporates, governments, development banks, uh, public-private partnerships, uh, local governments like cities, um, commercial banks, and so on and so forth. And so who's driving this market? Um, you know, as I was saying, deal flow uh, to date uh, has, has been a challenge. The appetite of investors is quite strong. Um, much of this is coming from uh, the institutional investor base, many of them with very strong uh, commitments to addressing climate. Um, institutional investors, particularly out of the Nordic region uh, of Europe, were very aware and had been looking over a long course of time the risks that climate was posing to their portfolios. And so it was a need to be able to find product green bonds in particular, that would be able to address those risks. And so development banks are very much uh, in a position to do this, and some of the early issuance that we had was coming from uh, European Investment Bank, World Bank, IFC, and following after that have been a number of development banks um, providing product to investors uh, that is meeting those green uh, ambitions. And, uh, you know, again, we have roughly 90 to 100 trillion of assets under management, and we've had a number of statements being made uh, by many of the institutional investor base. Some of the targets and mandates put forward are coming from uh, German development bank, KFW, uh, Zurich insurers, and I must admit that the insurance industry has been a key driver to buying green bonds uh, and making strong statements along with uh, other investor groups uh, and asset managers. So it is um, very much driven uh, by the global institutional investor base to date. 
The growth of green bonds is quite an impressive story, I have to say. Um, back in 2008, I would say, is where we started to see those early issuances where, in, as I said prior to uh, the institutional investor base signaling to the market that they were looking for this product, and you had those early issuances coming out of the World Bank and the IB. But by 2012 and into 2013, we started to see the, the attention grow. And then 20, the early part of 2013 is when IFC with their benchmark issuance of 1 billion euros against the renewable energy portfolio. It gained traction and, and, and attention within the market. I believe that bond was uh, closed within a two hour window. And that got the attention of corpor uh, the, the, the corporate and the bank side of the commercial banks. By the end of 2013, we had uh, roughly about uh, 12 billion in issuance. Um, by 2014, we were close to 40 billion. 2014 was the year of green bonds. We had uh, EDF, GDF, Suez, we had Unilever, we had a number of different issuance coming out of the U.S. muni market. It was quite a successful year and got quite attention globally. 2015, hitting close to the same numbers, a little bit more, but not uh, drastically. But one thing that we did notice here at CBI with our engagement within the market is that countries around the world were paying attention, particularly China and India, and they were getting ready for uh, entering the market. So much of 2015 was learning about what this market was, how can we participate, and what's, you know, what, what role do we have to play as governments to, to, to have a market and participate? This year has started off with a bang. At the moment, we are at sitting around 18 billion. The development of the Chinese market is already predicting 46 billion alone for China. And of course, numbers now and with the level of issuance that we're expecting to see, we're looking at 100 billion by the end of the year alone. So this market is off to a very good start and most definitely huge potential uh, for other uh, market entry. Giving you a breakdown of some of the areas that we've seen to date, but by no means uh, does it mean that we are limited to just these areas, but this is just commonly what we have seen so far, heavily weighted on renewable energy, but we've also seen an increase in energy efficiency, particularly across the building sector. Low carbon transport tied very much to green city bonds, uh, much of this coming out of the US. We've seen a few of this in Europe, we've seen a few of this in China. Um, sustainable water is also beginning to gain traction. In fact, we've just recently seen an issue of San Francisco Public Utilities under the U.S. recently coming to market with their certified green bond uh, tied to wastewater and storm management. And then, of course, we've got um, adaptation projects, agriculture and forestry. But, you know, we expect to see these areas to grow significantly, and particularly into areas like ag and forestry, bioenergy, once we begin to get a better understanding of what those investment opportunities are and the green credentials behind those, we believe that we will see an increase in investment in those areas as well. To give you a sense of what we, where we have seen, um, this is a close of 2015 geographical spread. Um, the next updated version will come in our 2016 report, but this is just to give you a sense of what we've seen to date. Um, China, India, again, some beginning opportunities to uh, be seen uh, in terms of discussions around Southeast Asia, um, but Latin America, huge opportunities to be had there, particularly in Brazil, where we're doing quite a bit of work, and in Mexico. And then, of course, uh, the European community and the U.S. markets continue to remain strong. Um, but it's really the areas of the emerging markets that we're getting quite excited about. And, you know, the contributions that China and India uh, are making have already been quite substantial. And what I'm trying to display here is, is really to give you a sense of opportunity. So the analysis that we do here at Climate Bonds Initiative within the State of the Market Report is a deep analysis of the bond market as a whole. So we look at not just the labeled market, which I've been discussing with you today, which is now sitting at about 100 billion outstanding since uh, 2008. 
that labeled market. We've also got the unlabeled market. And what I mean by that is bonds that are out in the market that are tied to renewable energy projects, maybe tied to sustainable water projects, maybe tied to rail projects and assets, but are not labeled as, you know, they don't have a thematic label tied to them. But they very much fit the climate agenda and can contribute to the overall labeled market. And that's sitting at about 600 billion outstanding. And that number continues to grow. And so the goal is very much to bring those into the labeled universe so that we can build scale and liquidity over time. And that really is where we're trying to get to. And then that target of hitting at about $1 trillion per annum doesn't become so impossible after all. So it really is about educating the market and showing what possibilities we have uh, in the long run to be able to address the challenge. And for then, of course, we ask the question, what, well, what are the benefits of issuing green? Okay, this is all great. You know, it sounds like it's just a marketing exercise. Why, why, why should we be doing this? And quite frankly, that's exactly what it is. It is a marketing exercise, but an incredibly successful one at that, and one that has come with incredible benefits, mostly uh, communication and education internally within organizations. Now you have corporate treasury who finally knows the name of the sustainability guy, and they're actually coordinating on what the company, what the government, what other bank, whatever the issuing entity may be, can offer the market. And so that has been one area of, of um, benefit that we have seen. But more importantly, why would the issuer be doing this? I mean, it's um, what is the drive? Because at the moment, there's not really a price advantage to doing this. And what I mean is by issue, you don't have an additional financial gain by issuing a green bond compared to a regular bond. But what you are getting is very much a diversity in your investor base. So investors that you may never have had before are finally coming to the table because they're looking for that product. And so an example I can give is the state of Massachusetts, who's been long running for having uh, investors, you know, issuing bonds on the market on a regular basis, but never able to get the types of investors that they really wanted, high quality investors. And when they came to market with their first green bond, not only did they get new investors within 10 to 15 different types, they ended up with the high high investors they've been targeting for years. So, you know, it, it was quite an advantage to them and one, enough for them to come, as a, come back again as a repeat issuer. It's also the investor engagement and keeping loyalty of your investors. The repeat issuers have reported that they've kept the same investors every time. And of course, it's a strengthening of the reputation. I mean, it very much shows leadership in the market. It is aligning with maybe very strong sustainability agendas that the issuer uh, entity may have. And so from an issuer's perspective at this stage, it's very much driving uh, their desire to participate. From the investor point of view, it is an opportunity to uh, green their portfolios, as I said. It is finding balance within their portfolios and transitioning over to uh, a more sustainable portfolio over the long term, uh, giving them access to green assets and projects uh, without project risks. So again, this is operational projects and assets that uh, it allows them to have a long-term strategy, investment strategy, and trading at a premium in the secondary markets eventually. It strengthens their reputation as well, keeping in line with some of their commitments that they've made, and a deeper engagement uh, with company managements on, on the green agenda. But the fundamental question, of course, is, well, how do we know that this is green? And this continues to be a topic of, of discussion and one that it grows um, and one that is at the very heart of Climate Bonds Initiative's uh, work streams. The good news to say is that at the start of this market, really when we started to see momentum, uh, the, the year of green bonds in 2014 was the entry of the green bond principles. And the green bond principles laid the found out foundation, and let me just say, a market entry point for issuers on what they need to do and consider recommended principles on how to come to market issuing a green bond, a framework, a guideline. 
And from that, issuers have been uh, appointing independent uh, bodies like uh, rating agencies. A few examples are Sustainalytics out of uh, Canada, Vigeo out of France, Cicero out of Norway, um, a number of different types of groups that are providing reviews to these bonds basing them off of the green bond principles. There's other examples of standards, existing standards serving as proxies. So what we've, a lot of what we've seen in the energy efficiency space for buildings has been leveraging LEED as a way of justifying those green credentials, other uh, types of standards and certification labels. Um, and another area that is growing significant momentum, particularly this year and late into last year, has been uh, the certification of green bonds, which is the, uh, the certification uh, scheme that, that Scanner Bonds Initiative provides. And this is something that has been built uh, as a program since the 2011 period. And the goal there is very much to support, support scalability uh, with a standards-based approach. And this is something that we're going to discuss in further detail through the series uh, over the next webinar. So I will keep that uh, um, uh, save that story for later. But the thing that's important to note here is that the majority of green bonds are getting an independent review, despite what the disclosure or quality to, uh, of the reporting may be. Um, the best practice is, is in play. Where we have not seen any independent reviews primarily is coming from maybe the development banks or municipalities out of the U.S., um, where much of that is dependent depending on their reputation as an issuer, um, and so they do not feel the need to, to do a review. And in some cases, we've had where the audit has been done primarily on the financial aspects of the bond, but hasn't been done on the environmental aspects. This is just to give you an example of some of the types of corporate green bonds we've seen to date. In fact, uh, one of the big bangs at the start of this year was Apple's uh, first green bond coming to the market and um, at about one and a half billion U.S. dollars. Quite a successful bond uh, covering a number of different areas like energy efficiency upgrades across their operations. They had some green buildings in there, uh, waste management, and so on and so forth. And of course, as you can see, you know, there are different types of entities. Um, Unilever was one of the early entrance corporate issuances uh, back in 2013, uh, setting the stage to fit in line with their sustainability living plan. And then we saw some other uh, exemplary bonds coming from GDF Suez, EDS, uh, Toyota for that matter. So this is a very much just a, a, a brief example. Um, you can find on our website uh, the full list of green bonds to date uh, that are listed on there if you would like to check that out. And just to give you a very quick overview uh, without diving too much into the details on uh, how does one actually come to issue a green bond, and this is uh, uh, something that we pulled from our green city bond work, um, but still very much uh, the same as, as if you were a corporate or uh, a bank issuer. Um, the first that very much is around project identification and preparation. So, um, you know, looking to see uh, what what projects and assets could potentially be eligible within your portfolios, and in some cases having uh, an advisor to to advise on what that is, and referencing to international standards or green definitions that are currently out in the market. And so this is an important piece is, you know, really looking to see what, you know, prioritize projects uh, using green criteria that's currently available. And then uh, taking on board a relation with a verifier um, who can then review the portfolio and how those align with current standards uh, to then have a, a review written up so that investors can um, know what you're actually offering into the market. And so the commitment by the issuer to do periodic uh, reporting, annual reporting uh, on an annual basis. There are a few challenges that we uh, have ourselves with green bonds. There's a variety of challenges that are impacting on the growth of the market as a whole, um, but by no means uh, not manageable and, and, and stuff that we are working on now. 
Um, much of it has been a volume of bankable projects and robust project pipelines. Um, you know, issuers not very clear about what is eligible, um, making sure that they're financially viable projects, and more importantly, scale. I mean, what we're looking at here is portfolios that are anywhere from 100 million or more. Um, the institutional investors are, are really looking for, for scale here. They don't really look at anything less than that. And so for companies, this can be quite challenging, um, figuring out uh, what, what, what assets are actually suitable to, to be able to do a bond. Um, the maturity of the bond markets in certain countries, so if I think outside of the U.S. and, and the European market, and I'm looking across Latin America or Southeast Asia, for example, in some cases, the bond market doesn't even exist. From, so, so you're starting starting from the beginning, and it's needing to understand what the policy framework is needed to create an enabling environment to support a market. And then, of course, it is you know preparing for bond financing and having commonly acceptable green standards. So this is an area of work that is developing, um, that's gaining momentum. But you know, a commonly agreed upon set of international standards is is still yet to be had. And so, uh, when we definitely start hunting down into local markets, um, it's important to provide that guidance so that we understand what the green investment opportunities are. But more importantly, that they're going to deliver on their impact. And then, of course, investors that are incredibly risk averse, lack of understanding and knowledge uh, on, uh, you know, really what is uh, investable and, and where we can be investing and the ability to be able to analyze the green credentials of bonds. So very much, again, relying on the due diligence to be done beforehand um, for those investors and the mainstream investors that don't have the internal due diligence capacity in, in, inside. And then, of course, the involvement of many stakeholders, the lack of coordination. So it's uh, about communication. It's about, again, coming back to my point, the sustainability team talking to corporate treasury. Uh, it's the ability to get coordination uh, to be able to do this as a, as a, as a coordinated effort. And then finally, it's um, looking to, to, to address those challenges. Uh, a lot of work the Climate Bonds Initiative is doing with many of its partners from around the world is building collaboration uh, across local markets. Uh, you know, many of the local market actors like investors and governments and companies and banks, we work in silos. And it's very much about pulling those together and getting communication and, 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 and discovering what the opportunities are, um, bringing uh, in-country actors together, so building that collaboration. There's also the need to develop green project pipelines. So the huge opportunity we have before us is looking at the uh, country INDCs and how can we convert those into investable project plans investable plans that institutional investors are interested in investing in. And so how do we do that? Uh, how do we translate those into green project pipelines? And of course, this is an area of work that is very much uh, at the heart of CBI and uh, particularly with our Green Infrastructure Investment Coalition, which we are going to be featuring India at the end of June as the first showcase country. Uh, where we will be doing that uh, collaboration uh, within. And then, of course, the strategic public green bond demonstration issuance. This is pretty key, getting local governments, national governments to issue bonds, including national development banks. This is exactly what their role is and to help build confidence within the market. And we've seen a few of these already. Nafin, the development bank out of Mexico, with their first issuance in 20 years was a green bond. We had it certified as a client bond standard for wind, for a large-scale wind portfolio, incredibly successful, issued on the international market. Metropolitan Transport Authority of New York, their inaugural green bond, which hit the market in February, uh, quite a successful uh, mark for them and uh, looking to uh, finance the uh, rail projects across New Manhattan. And then we've seen with the ADB, Asian Development Bank, uh, for geothermal assets and so on and so forth. So public sector entities really do have an important role to play in contributing towards uh, market growth. And then the development of green bond standards, as I said, um, green definitional work, 
making sure that we have a multi-stakeholder approach to feeding into uh, standards, providing guidance to issuers, and providing assurance to investors on what they're investing in. It's an incredibly important uh, piece to the story. And let me just finally say that Christina Figueres from the UNFCCC, after COP, making it quite clear that all infrastructure has to now be green. And rivers of capital need to flow to assets and projects that are the right ones for the 2050 world we have to build. So with that, let me thank you all. We are very much happy to, to turn this over to Q&A. Let me turn it over to Johnny so she can provide you with some direction on this. Thank you, Justine. Uh, two ways you can ask a question. One second. Uh, you can continue using the Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner, or alternatively, just use the little box just above the Q&A box with a little hand. If you click on this, I will unmute your mic, call on you, and you can ask your question verbally. We've had a couple of questions already. First comes from Vivian. A couple of technical issues here, just one second. Okay, the first comes from Vivian, who asks, is there a difference in the capital cost of a green bond, X, versus a regular bond? Would companies have incentives to pursue green bonds as a source of finance or credit? A good question, Vivian. I should mention, uh, which I didn't go into details of. Um, yeah, I mean, there are some costs associated with doing a green bond, um, and it can mostly comes primarily with the verification fees or doing the independent third-party review. Uh, comes with some cost. The ranges have, since the market has taken off and diversified and, and the, uh, the verifier base, you're now looking at anywhere from can be as low as 5,000 US dollars to 50,000 US dollars. So it is quite a large range, and we're careful to not um, be too specific about it um, because, you know, at the moment it's just uh, uh, what you hear going through the market. Um, but there is the verifier fee, and internally as well, depending on the setup of the issuer at the start. Coming back to my point that one important piece to the green bond is the ability to track and manage proceeds, report on the use of proceeds. And so uh, it depends on whether that internal uh, tracking system is already in place within the issuer, issuing entity. And, and if not, there will be some costs to set up to that. Another question here, Ivo asks, what are the developments in terms of issuing green bonds focused on scaling up investment in sustainable land use? Yeah, Ivo, that's a really good uh, question and an area of work that Climate Bonds Initiative has been focusing quite a lot on. Um, it has been small in numbers to date only because there is uh, a, a conceived perception of risk within the space, probably rightfully so, but uh, from an investor's point of view and from an issuer's point of view, not really understanding what those investment opportunities are, that's one. Another challenge is scale, so being able to uh, get large-scale portfolios uh, that are attractive for, for green bond financing uh, to attract institutional investors uh, that are set. And so if we have uh, a number of scattered uh, land use projects uh, at around one million or less, or, or just a little bit more, you know, there's got to have that ability to aggregate those into a sizable portfolio. It's also being able to determine uh, the boundaries around mitigation adaptation opportunities, defining that criteria. And so, of course, this is a lot of work that CBI has been doing over the past year, um, and we will be looking to launch our agriculture, forestry, and other land use uh, standard here in, uh, in the next month or two. So do watch this space. Um, we will be uh, setting up some webinars uh, to go through that. So we'll make sure that we keep you posted. Mai Lin asks, to what extent is there a meaningful secondary market for green bonds now and likely to be in the future? And when might this be? 
That's a good question. We have started to see a secondary market. Um, I'm going to refrain from going too much into details. There has been uh, also rumor around um, price differential. Uh, in some cases, up to 20 base points advantage. And so I think that if we manage to hit 100 billion by the end of this year and continue on that momentum, then we'll very much find ourselves uh, with liquidity uh, sooner than we think. Pamela asks, how does securitization in the fragmented green markets fit into discussion as the needed lever to drive scale and increase investment recycled capital? It's a great question, Pamela, and um, huge opportunity to be had. Green securitization is an area of work that uh, Climate Bonds Initiative, along with um, Global Environment Facility and uh, the UNDP, are uh, kicking off work exactly in this. There is um, a lot of questions around what the standardization should be around green securitization, as much of the work. Um, huge opportunity to be able to aggregate um, uh, you know, renewable energy projects across Southeast Asia, for example, into sizable portfolios that then can be uh, attractive to institutional investors. This is, you know, with, with the opportunity to be able to define and set the right standards for uh, green securitization, we open up the door to a lot of opportunities that currently um, make difficult for us, as I was saying. Uh, small, standalone pro renewable energy projects are too risky. Uh, and, and just don't carry the weight to, to be attractive to investors. So um, to, to, to just let you know, we do have uh, work focusing on this as a collaborative effort, and we would be happy to, to fill you in on that. Uh, I can put you in touch with the right folks who follow up by email. Alexander asks, the oceans are the world's largest climate sink, larger than forests. Some pilot projects are working on this. Is the CBI in touch with any of them about funding through bonds? Again, another excellent question, Alexander. I'm happy to say that we have just recently kicked off our Marine Technical Working Group. I haven't gone into this discussion on this presentation about standards. This is going to be another feature to our series in the next round of webinars, so do pay, pay close attention to that. But what I will say is that the Marine Technical Working Group was launched uh, last month, and an area of work is going to be very much to look at the opportunities that the ocean environment will pose to contributing to this. What are the investment opportunities in the marine sector? You know, looking at opportunities across uh, coastal infrastructure, um, oceans themselves, fisheries, um, looking at the, the Green Barrier Reef, for example, those types of ecosystems. So yes, a lot of this work is going to be really laying out the grounds for what investment opportunities we have for bonds. In, 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 that, in that part of the environment. So thanks for asking that question. Next question, are, are climate bonds open to non-institutional investors? If not, do you think this will be something available in the future? So yes, we have actually seen uh, a few bonds hit the market targeting the retail investors. Um, so it hasn't been on uh, institutional investor base. The majority of it very much is. So I will say that this is targeting more on the, the, the pension funds, or the wealth funds, and the like, but we have seen some of this in the in the U.S. market, um, particularly the municipality market, which has been a huge contributor to the green bond numbers. And in fact, if I look at the MTA deal, it not only targeted uh, institutional investors, it also was quite successful in the retail market. Um, the bond closed at about 780 million, and 250 million of that was uh, retail investors. So. We've also seen the example of, of World Bank, who's issued grid bonds uh, for retail, but it is a small share when compared to the institutional investor base. Alex asks, should green bonds better engage retail investors who are increasingly seeking SRI assets? I think eventually we're going to get there, Alex. I think it's still early days in the market um, to, 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 to be seeing this as uh, one that is getting the attention of, of retail. I think there's still a lot of uh, market education to be had there as well, um, but by no means uh, is it going to be limited to institutional investors. It's just at this early stage, that's where the market is. Sabine asks, are there bonds which sum up various renewable energy projects within one bond? So yes, I mean, this is like a, a more uh, 
corporate use of proceeds bond example, uh, or if I look at the IFC bond, which was a large-scale portfolio of different types of renewable energy, so uh, wind and solar, for example. Um, we've also seen a mix of hydropower projects, wind and solar. So yes, it's definitely not just tied to one type, and again, in, it's essentially making sure that we have operational assets, um, portfolios that are able to deliver on their return. Time for just a couple more questions. One from Anthony here. What opportunities are there for developing countries, for example, African countries, to issue green bonds, either corporate, municipal, or state? Are their bond markets mature enough? That's a great question, Anthony. Um, so in Africa, it, there hasn't been uh, a lot of momentum. Um, there's been a, a few uh, examples of where um, some African countries, like Kenya, for example, have uh, huge prospects for, for engaging in the market, um, particularly looking at the renewable energy base and the aggregation uh, set up for green securitization. You know, in the long run, there will be opportunities to be had. Um, where we have seen some developments within the emerging economy uh, has been mainly coming out of India and China, as I mentioned, um, and areas across Latin America. Some of the work that we're doing is working closely with governments, um, both at the local and national level, along with uh, local market actors, to determine what it will take to be able to establish uh, the right enabling environment to issue bonds. Uh, you know, every every state is at a different um, development process. I mean, like I said, in some cases, they've never even they don't even have a, a, a regular bond market. So it's it's really looking to see how we can build these things in parallel. Um, and really, when we look at municipality opportunities, we're looking at the green city bond opportunities. So one example has been Johannesburg where back in 2014 they were one of the first to come to market issuing a green city bond and they used those proceeds uh, for a number of different areas like energy efficiency, transport, and, and water within the city. So I think, you know, in time we'll get there um, and I think there's still a lot of work uh, where these emerging markets have the greatest opportunity but they also have the need to, to build the right infrastructure to be able to support the market. Just time for one final question. What are the benefits of using climate bond certification and the difference between that and getting a second review? Yes, yeah, so that's um, quite, in, in fact, that's a good question. Um, and, and I do encourage to, for you to, to attend the, the next webinar that we'll be having and we'll go in a little bit more um, uh, detail on this. What I will say is that the difference simply is, is that the, the certification feeds is, is built off of the standards program. So the standard that the Climate Bonds Initiative develops uh, feeds into a certification. But that standard is developed by a multi-stakeholder approach. It's got about 80 plus organizations behind it that feed into it. Um, and so it's actually not CBI who determines really what the green investment landscape is. It's more based on the scientific evidence that we have relative to where we need to be with climate and the experience, the expertise, the wide expertise that we gather globally from all the experts that sit within our technical committee that are developing the standard. And so the verifier is referring to that and depending on that um, to, to do you know, the analysis on the bond and then that comes under a certification, which is done under our Climate Bond Standard Board. So our Climate Bond Standard Board consists of investors, government entities like the California State Treasury, NGOs, uh, insurance funds, and they're there to review uh, all uh, bond certifications for the market um, under the certification program. And then, of course, with the second party opinion review, which has been quite successful, and um, uh, one very important note to make is it's been encouraging the transparency element within the market, um, many of them referring to the green bond principles as a guiding point. Um, the difference there is that it, you don't have an A plus organization feeding into a standard development. It is one entity that is reviewing a bond with the issuer. So it's more about reviewing what the issuer is putting forward to them, what the issuer's green bond framework is. Um, so that's hopefully uh, been able to, to, to provide some distinction for you without going too much into the detail. I do encourage you to, to attend the next session, which will go into the details of the difference between the two. And unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much for tuning in.
Just a reminder that this webinar has been recorded and we'll be sending this out to all those who registered. Next week's webinar, as Justine just said, will focus on our certification and standards work. Details on how to register for this will come out on our blog in the coming days. You can register for our blog on our website. Uh, we look forward to having you on future Climate Bonds Initiative webinars and to updating you on the exciting developments happening in the Green Bond space. Thank you and have a good day. <laughs>